Welcome back to Beautiful Disasters. I'm so glad to welcome you back to the channel as we explore stories that started with great moments, but quickly spiraled down. Before we get into today's topic, I would like to ask that you subscribe to the channel so that you can keep up with all of my updates. The Gilded Ages story begins almost two decades after the abolition of slavery in the US. This means that the show's creative team was well within its rights to depict a struggling African-American family. It also shows the Scott family, which is a, a well-to-do household that African-Americans would find refreshing. Erica Armstrong Dunbar, the show's historical consultant and one of its producers, and I quote, it means a great deal to me to have black folks tune in to the Gilded Age and to feel represented. We're in a moment where we need to see dignity, where we need to reconcile with the violence and the trauma of segregation, of anti-blackness, but also to see how these men and women who lived in the 19th century managed to live with that and still not be dehumanized by it. End quote. Peggy Scott played by Denise Benson, the ambitious writer. Peggy grew up in New York and studied at Philadelphia's Institute for Colored Youth. Upon meeting Marion, she struggles with her past and the questions she still has about it. She decides to return home to face her problems. After meeting Marion, both women forge an unlikely bond as they start their lives in New York City. However, Peggy's secret will be revealed, which will cause a major change in her life. After finishing her education at the Institute, Peggy became acquainted with Marion Brooke, who was related to the Van Ryan family. She then accepted the position of secretary to Agnes, who Marion's aunt. Peggy also goes to work for T. Thomas Fortune, who is the journalist for the New York Globe, a prominent black newspaper. The Gilded Age, which is an HBO drama, explores the lives of wealthy African-Americans during the late 19th century. She was part of an educated and wealthy family. Peggy's father worked as a pharmacist while her mother was a pianist. She moved to New York City in search of a new start. Following the Emancipation Proclamation signing in 1863, the era of the Gilded Age saw an increase in education, real estate, and business opportunities for African-Americans. Scott was greatly influenced by the achievements of African-American women, such as journalist Ida B. Wells, Julia C. Collins, and Susan McKinney Stewart, the first black female doctor in New York. Another influence for Scott's character was Julia C. Collins, whose 1865 novel, The Curse of Case, or The Slave Bride, is widely cited as the first novel written by an African-American woman. Not much is found on Julius Collins' life. But here's what we know so far. Scholars believe that Collins was born a free woman in 1842. Although her early life is not known, it's believed that she was born in the North. Collins taught African-American children in the town of Williamsport, Pennsylvania, according to an April 16, 1864 issue of the Christian Recorder, a national newspaper of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Williamsport was an active station on the Underground Railroad. Aside from teaching, Collins also wrote various essays about empowerment and racial uplift, which were published in the Christian Recorder. Some scholars believe that she was a well-educated individual due to the references she made to notable individuals such as Lord Alfred and Shakespeare. It is theorized that she was the stepdaughter of Enoch Gilchrist, who was a black abolitionist and underground railroad conductor. This places her in a very active and educated family. The Gilchrist family was active in the local African-American Episcopal Church, in politics, and in the fight to gain legal rights for blacks. Julia Green was living with him in the 1860 census, and it's thought, although not proven, that this is the Julia who went on to marry Stephen Carlyle Collins. Stephen Collins was an officer's servant before enlisting in the Civil War in the 6th United States Colored Infantry Regiment. After the war, he operated a barber shop in Williamsport and served as a commander in the GARE, a veterans organization for Civil War soldiers. Barbers and school teachers were higher status occupations for African Americans in the 19th century, leading researchers to believe that the Collinses would have been respected and connected in the Williamsport community. I quote, we are born with faculties and power capable of almost anything. Collins wrote in the Christian Recorder, who can measure our capacity or set bounds to our progression in knowledge, end quote. 
Collins published The Curse of Case, or The Slave Bride in serial form over eight months in 1865 in The Christian Recorder. The novel grappled with themes of racial identity, interracial marriage, and the injustices of slavery and racism. The novel centers around Lena, who is a mixed race slave from New Orleans. She falls in love with Richard, who was the son of a slave owner in New Orleans. Although Richard discovers the truth of her identity, the couple marries. Enraged by this, Richard's father decides to disinherit him. The newlyweds flee north to Connecticut, but Lena dies in childbirth soon after. Richard, who believes his baby daughter died as well, returns to New Orleans to make peace with his father. Meanwhile, an orphan child Claire grows up not knowing who her parents were or her own race. The story abruptly ends just as the plot reaches the climax and resolution with a chance discovery and reunion just on the horizon as Collins died suddenly of tuberculosis in November 1865. Collins never finished her novel, but scholars of African American history have sought to continue her legacy. In 2006, the Oxford University Press published Collins' novel with two alternative endings, written by editors and scholars Mitch Katchen and William Andrews. Throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, journalist and activist Ida Wells Barnett exposed the conditions of African Americans in the South using her skills as a writer. She fought against racism and sexism in her lifetime. Ida Wells Barnett was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi on July 16, 1862. She was born into slavery and her parents became involved in politics following the Civil War. She later enrolled at Russ College, but she was kicked out after she had a disagreement with the university's president. In 1978, while visiting her grandmother, Wells Barnett learned that a yellow fever outbreak had ravaged her hometown. The disease had taken both of her parents as well as her infant sibling. To maintain the family, she took a job as a teacher. She then moved her siblings to Tennessee. Wells Barnett worked as an educator in Memphis. In 1884, she sued a train company in Memphis after she was thrown off a train. Although she won her case at the local level, it was eventually overturned by a federal court. Following the lynching of a friend, she became more focused on white mob violence. She began investigating lynchings and she published a pamphlet about some of the cases. The backlash caused her to leave Memphis and she would later move to Chicago. Wells Barnett's work had angered the locals who burned her press. Wells Barnett was part of a group that called for a boycott of the 1893 Columbian Exposition, which they claimed discriminated against African Americans. She then got married to Ferdinand Barnett, a prominent African American lawyer. They had four children together throughout her career. Wells Barnett balanced activism with motherhood. During her travels, Wells Barnett exposed lynching to audiences in other countries. She also confronted members of the suffrage movement who didn't take the issue seriously. Because of this, she was often ostracized back home. Despite this, she continued to fight for women's rights. She helped found the National Association for Colored Women. It was created to address the issues related to women's suffrage and civil rights. During her time in Niagara Falls, she was not mentioned as a founder of the NAACP. She later focused on urban renewal in Chicago, and she passed away on March 25, 1931. Susan Stewart was the first African-American woman in New York to earn a medical degree. She was born to Sylvanus and Ann Springstead, and she was of mixed heritage. She was also the third woman in the country to receive a medical doctorate. In 1867, Susan Smith enrolled at the Medical School for Women in New York. She finished her MD in 1870, and she married William McKinney in 1871. They had two children. Dr. Smith McKinney was able to accomplish many professional achievements. She established her own practice in Brooklyn, and it lasted until 1895. During this time, she co-founded the Brooklyn Women's Homeopathic Hospital and Dispensary, which served the African-American community, completed postgraduate education at the Long Island Medical College Hospital in Brooklyn, 1887-1888. Practiced at the Brooklyn Home for Aged Color People, where she also served as a board member, 1892-1895, and practiced at New York Medical College and Hospital for Women in Manhattan, 1892, 1896. She specialized in childhood diseases and prenatal care, and she provided papers on these subjects. 
During this period, the Gilded Age was unfolding. William G. McKinney died in 1892, and in 1896, Dr. Smith McKinney married Theophilus Gould Stewart, an ordained minister and US Army chaplain. She traveled with him for several years throughout the West Army medical licenses in Montana and Wyoming. In 1898, Dr. Smith McKinney Stewart was hired by Wilberforce University in Ohio as a resident physician and faculty member to teach health and nutrition. Reverend Stewart joined the faculty shortly there after teach history. She remained at Wilberforce until her death 22 years later. She was active in various local organizations and women's suffrage advocacy. She was also a prominent public speaker. In 1911, she gave a presentation entitled Color Women in America at the Universal Race Congress held at London's University of London. She delivered a speech entitled Women in Edison in 1914 at the National Association for Color Women's Clubs Convention. She had been a practicing doctor for 48 years prior to her death in 1918. Following her death, W.A.B. Dubois delivered a eulogy at her funeral, and she was buried in Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery. It is one of the first major rural cemeteries in the country and is known for its history and architecture. In 1974, a junior high school in Brooklyn was renamed after Dr. Susan Smith McKinney. A couple years later, black physicians in the states of Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York were able to honor her by forming their own society. Timothy Thomas Fortune, played by Sullivan Jones, is based on the radical real-life journalist, publisher, and civil rights leader. In the Gilded Age, he meets Peggy Scott. Peggy wants to get her writing published, but she was treated unfairly by the editor of the Advocate newspaper. Because of her skin color, the Advocate offered to publish Miss Scott's writing under demeaning conditions. Peggy refused the Advocate, but she was soon contacted by T. Thomas Fortune, the editor of the New York Globe, a prominent black newspaper. Fortune was impressed by Peggy's work and by Miss Scott herself. He offered Peggy an assignment to write about her political perspective and convictions as an African-American. Fortune was an African-American journalist. He was born on October 3, 1856 in Mariana, Florida. He was raised in a community where he witnessed the Ku Klux Klan's violence. Despite having minimal formal education, he worked in a print shop when he was a child. He moved to North in 1874. After working as a customs inspector for a couple years, Fortune decided that he wanted to become a journalist. He left Howard University a year after he got there. Fortune established a People's Advocate in 1876 in Alexandria, Virginia after he got married to Carrie C. Smiley. He moved to New York where he established the New York Globe in 1881. It stayed in existence until 1960 and it had been changed several times. The New York Globe had been renamed the New York Freeman in the New York Age. He became very concerned about the conditions of African Americans in the South. He began using the press to improve these conditions and he would eventually become one of the most prominent African American journalists in the country. In 1889, the New York Freeman was renamed the New York Age and Fortune would serve as its editor until 1907. He became known for being an activist who was also dedicated to defending the rights of African Americans. In 1887, Fortune helped found the National Afro-American League, which was aimed at fighting against acts of terrorism and lynching. The league's local and state branches served as models for other civil rights groups, such as the Niagara Movement. In 1909, the NAACP was also founded. During this period, Fortune believed that there was still a lot of work to be done in improving the conditions of African Americans in the South. Still, he respected Booker T. Washington's work in the region. In 1899, he became more involved with the political circle of the founder of Tuskegee, Alabama. Fortune would often write essays and speeches that had Washington's name, and his relationship with him eventually became widely known. In 1907, Washington supported the purchase of the New York Age by Fred Moore. In 1911, Fortune got back into the New York Age after suffering from various mental illnesses. He stayed there until 1914, and he noted that he became more spiritually connected to Frederick Douglass. Fortune's career in journalism had been saved once more when he was 67 years old and was given the position of editor of Marcus Garvey's Negro World. He would hold this position until his passing. Fortune, who was 72 years old at the time of his death, passed away on June 2, 1928 in Philadelphia. 
But in the Gilded Age, the writer and activist is in his prime and Fortune is bound to be a major player in Peggy Scott's life and career. Property Booker Washington, Washington played by Michael Brawley. The Gilded Age season two, episode five, His Grace the Duke introduces us to more than one great influential man. Intrepid journalist Peggy Scott and T. Thomas Fortune travel to Tuskegee to meet real life groundbreaker Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington is one of the most controversial and dominant figures in african-american history according to his autobiography up from slavery 1901 he did not know the exact year date in place of his birth or his father's name yet it is widely understood that he was born enslaved on april 5th 1856 in halesford virginia um, his mother's name was Jane and his father was from a plantation. When he was nine years old, Washington was able to escape from slavery and move to West Virginia. Prior to this, he had always been referred to simply as Booker. He changed his name after he started grammar school because he wanted to have two names. When he was 16 years old, Washington started college at the Agriculture and Normal Institute in Virginia. After a couple years at Wayland Seminary, he returned to teach at the Institute. The officials at Hampton recommended him for the position of principal at the Tuskegee University, which was eventually opened in 1881. He held this position for 34 years until he passed away in 1915. Washington was able to use his position at the Tuskegee Institute to promote his theory and educational philosophy about the advancement of African-Americans. He delivered a speech at the Cotton States Exposition that year in Atlanta, Georgia. He talked about how African-Americans could get their constitutional rights by improving their moral and economic status through their own means instead of using political and legal avenues. He also stated that African-Americans should start compromising and accepting segregation, which would earn him the title of the Great Accommodator. He secretly contributed to the legal battles against Jim Crow laws and forced segregation. He had never publicly condemned these actions, but he had contributed to the legal battles against them. This revelation has led to various discussions about the complexity of his methods. Scholars and other observers have also questioned who the real Washington was. His accomplishments such as his work with the Negro Business League and his contributions to African-American advancement are numerous. In 1940, he became the first African-American to appear on a U.S. postage stamp. In 1951, a coin featuring Washington was issued. He received an honorary Master of Arts degree from Harvard University in 1896 and an honorary doctorate from Dartmouth College in 1901. At Tuskegee University, there is a monument in his honor called Lifting the Veil. He lifted the follows. He lifted the veil of ignorance from his people and pointed a way to progress through education and industry. On November 14, 1915, Washington passed away at his home on the campus of the Tuskegee Institute. He was 59 years old at that time. The show definitely depicts the reality of what blacks went through during the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age is set less than two decades after the end of slavery. During this time, Dunbar noted that African Americans wanted to form an elite that would protect them from racial discrimination. This would likely include religious piety, education, and thrift. Even though they had escaped slavery, Dunbar noted that African Americans still faced discrimination. He noted that the black elite in New York would fight against the segregation in schools. According to Richardson Whitfield, if the black elite was not portrayed in a way that reflected the real African Americans, people would not respect it. They would instead believe that it was made up for television. Share your thoughts on the show's black characters in the comments section below. Please let me know what you think about how the show depicted the experiences of African Americans during the Gilded Age. Until next time, take care of yourselves because I love y'all.